Hello, hello. I'm Savannah. I'm Alicia. And this is Burden of Proof. Hello, everyone. Hello. You made it through Shabiznis. <laughs> You're here. Last... You came back after that horrible case. <laughs> Look at you, you <laughs> scamp. You're doing so good. <laughs> well, they're doing good. Shabiznis is not. Shabiznis is not. And um, we made it through Shabiznis. So yeah. let's give ourselves a gold star because that was rough. And if you're brand new and this is the first case you're listening to, <laughs> we should say it, it, it'll be the second case on the list. Yeah, it's shabiznis from last was week. last week and it was a rough one. We're not just saying the word shabiznis. It's not our made up word. Yeah. But if you like this episode, go listen to shabiznis. Yes. What you got for us this week? So... I don't know how popular I I would say this is somewhere middle of the road. So okay. you may know this story. You may not. It's an older case. It is Ellie Nestler. Okay. Ellie Nestler story. I don't recognize although, the name, but that doesn't mean much. Although I will say I'm kind of covering like I go into some aftermath cuz you know, I love doing that. Mm-hmm. I'm just a person that when I hear any kind of story and then it just ends, I'm like, but where are they now? Like, what happened yeah. to them after? So I do my best to keep going with mm-hmm. the my research. Well, I, think it, I think it helps humanize true crime victims as well as like if they're not dead or if their family's not dead after the incident, they still have to move on from that. And that's hard. Yeah. Well, in this case, you're not going to probably feel very sorry for the victim. Oh, no. Ellie was actually kind of deemed a sort of hero. Yeah. So, plot twist. Okay. All right. Let me first introduce the Nestler family, starting with Ellie, or Elena Star Nestler, better known as Ellie, grew up on Central California ranches the eldest daughter of a coal miner and his wife. So when we're talking Central California, think gold mining. Okay. Okay. After a first failed marriage, she later met Bill Nessler, a crop duster who also chased a dream for mining gold. This was strange to me. I'm sure it's not, especially to people who live in that area, because this was like, in the 1970s, 1980s. Okay. So when you think of gold mining, you don't think 1970s no, and all. 80s. But sure enough, like, it was still a thing. Well, I will say my dad went through a gold mining phase when I was a kid. Oh. We got him a gold panning kit for Christmas. Took it out to the creek. He had fun. Nice. Mm-hmm. It's fun. But not in the sense of, like, he wants to go like mining for gold in a in a gold mine, birds and all. Like we we were yeah. just in our backyard. Yeah. So shortly after getting married, Ellie gave birth to their first child, William, better known as Willie. And then they quickly moved to Liberia, Africa. Oh. Seeking fortune in the gold mining industry. Okay. When Willie was just an infant, there was a big gold rush apparently at that time. All right. After giving birth to their second child, Rebecca, Liberia had broke out in civil war. So Ellie took the children back to California. Bill stayed in Liberia. Apparently, nothing was going to get in the way of his gold mining. Let the man dig. Give him a pickaxe. Yeah. And a song. He's going to be good. (laughs) Like an old mining song. Hi-ho. They ultimately settled in the small central California town of Sonora, which is kind of just outside of where she grew up. Okay. Now, generally speaking, Ellie is portrayed as a loving and fairly overprotective mom who rarely, if ever, left her children with anyone other than her closest family and friends. Okay. Like, okay, cool. Seems responsible. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she had her reasons, which we'll come to find out. But yeah, it was enough that it stood out to people. But she never really explained why. It was just she's protective. So possibly the first time she let her guard down, though, she allowed Willie to be away to attend a church camp. The summer of 1988, 
when Willie was just six years old. Based on your face, you see where this is going. (laughs) Unfortunately, Willie returned a completely different kid. Suddenly, her kind and caring boy was withdrawn, but having angry outbursts. Months would go by before Willie had the courage to tell Ellie about the horrific events that took place at that camp. So, allow me to introduce you to the man responsible for Willie's differences. Daniel Mark Driver, a 35-year-old convicted child molester, was an employee at the church camp Willie attended. In 1983, Driver had pled guilty to lewd and lascivious conduct with two boys ages 8 and 10 in a San Jose court. And he's at a camp. Yes. He was sentenced to 150 days in jail, fined $750, and then released on probation. Hmm. Seems like a great punishment. In his psychiatric report from that conviction, the doctor determined that Driver was a, quote, self-sacrificing, eager-to-please individual, but that, quote, his expectations of gratification in return cause a great deal of unconscious anger. So he has no problem, like, helping people, but he expects stuff in return. Something like that. Yeah. Apparently, Driver only admitted to molesting one of those boys, and he blamed the boy's mother for it. He claimed that it was his anger towards her that caused him to act out in an attempt to hurt her. Because he had been trying to date her, but it became obvious to him that she was just using him as a babysitter. I I don't even know what to say to that. Yeah. You want to, okay, nope, Mm -mm. You want to date the mom, but you want to touch the little boy? Yeah. Something tells me you're also not interested in a grown woman. Yeah. The doctor's recommendation was while Driver could benefit from psychotherapy, he should be considered for parole. I'm sure that the laws today and the sentences today still don't seem enough in a lot of these cases. But this is why, like, the statistics on kids in my generation, Mm -hmm. in the older millennials, was so high for for molestation Mm -hmm. and or child rape because the penalties were like they're just letting them back out there on the freaking wrist. Yeah, like it it was nothing. They're just roaming free to do it again. Now, based on my sources, I believe Driver was actually hired at the church camp to work in the mess hall or cafeteria. It doesn't matter. So you would think, though, that that would limit his interactions with the kids. But he was still able to groom Willie, as they all do. Mm -hmm. He befriended Willie, which led to affection, inappropriate touching, and eventually rape. Driver threatened to kill Willie, his mom, and his sister if he ever told anyone what happened. The timeline of events after Willie informs his mom of the abuse is a little blurry due to the fact that most sources on this case focus kind of on what happened during his trial. So, like, the before stuff and what his trial would have been about. Yeah. Like, he never really gets to trial. So... We don't get a lot of details as to... I hope I think I know what you mean. Yes. However, I think I can kind of give you a tentative timeline if I've pieced things together correctly. So it wasn't until May of 1989 that Willie had told Ellie what happened at the camp. So almost a year, like 10 Mm -hmm. months after he was at the camp. She initially didn't get him any help because, unfortunately, she, too, had been abused as a child and seemed to have a rather distorted view on how one is supposed to cope with it. I think that's a lot of times with people who go through sexual abuse like that. Yes. It is very common to have that because of the way that the abuse is done, because you're groomed into saying nothing. Yes. So it's hard to talk about it. 
it also has, and I say that, I guess if I haven't already prefaced on this show <laughs> or you're new to the show, um, I too am a survivor of abuse and I've never had a problem talking about it because I was fortunate enough to have parents, but especially my mom, who A, believed me right away, mm-hmm. B, took action right away. And C, never, never made me feel like I had to be ashamed, like I did anything yeah. wrong, nothing. So I was extremely fortunate because as any survivors out there know, we tend to gravitate toward each other mm-hmm. in, in just life. Mm-hmm. So survivor, I mean, some of that is just flat out statistics. That there's like ungodly amount of people who have suffered this. But I think that it often too, there's just like you tend to share some weird understanding or connection with a person before you even realize that that's yeah. what it is and then at some point in your friendship or relationship it comes out and you're like oh that's why we get that you know so many of the people that i have known that suffered similar things either they themselves were groomed into thinking something bad was going to happen or they were scared as to how people would react to it, the people in their lives. Mm -hmm. Or in some of the worst cases I've heard about, their grown-ups or loved ones actually shamed them into being quiet. Yeah. And I think that in Ellie's case, that may have been the thing. Mm Mm-hmm. I think Ellie may have tried to tell family members or loved ones, and she was basically told, like, it happens, get over it. I don't know that for a fact, but it's sort of alluded to in especially the one movie, but that could just be dramatized. But you just kind of get that sense in the little bits that you Mm -hmm. read about her talking about it. So. Exactly. Here we are. She did report it to the police even though she didn't get him help, which is good. That is, yeah. You did something. So the police begin to investigate, and they find three more victims from the same camp. Mm. Those boys... When was he working? He seems like he was a really busy... Yeah. Like, I could see how he could get away with one, but it's kind of... Yeah, he. there was not enough supervision when you know that there's, like... Yeah. I just don't see... Mm, I don't see... I don't see how you could ever hire somebody with the history in that to work at a camp. I think you have to keep in mind the context of the time period. Like today, I don't, I would be like, you just weren't looking at all. Like, Oh, I guess you're like, right. There's not like. But in 1980, mid 1980s, you know, like in the movie mm-hmm. about this, he fills out the application. He's got like discrepancy if you will you know like he had Mm -hmm. a period of time well he was in jail and so they ask him like oh you haven't been working for a few months or whatever and he just like made something up and they're they have no way of a small town a small church camp i think that they just didn't have the resources Mm because back then they would have had to do like a whole pay for a whole background check mm-hmm. it just would have been way more involved than what we have today with technology yeah so i mean in fairness to them uh, i don't you're think right. i don't think they were particularly did anything that wasn't being done across the board everywhere you're probably right i think true it is true nowadays too where a lot of that stuff is a little bit more supervised not oh, to the extent that it should be. Like, I understand, you know, there are some yeah. places that it absolutely lacks, but... Like, my home church mm-hmm. in Ohio, I worked in the children's ministry. You were not to be ever alone with a child. Ever. Like, pretty much ever. Especially not opposite sex. And, well, that's a whole... That's a whole other issue that I, ne- that I never personally liked. But, but whatever. Yeah. Um... But generally speaking, everybody was pretty good about even trying not to be alone with a same-sex child. Yeah. Because you just never know. Like, even- Well, you have to make the rule so that, you know, people who are a danger aren't, you know, anyway, you know what we're saying. Yes. Yeah, we could go down that. (laughs) That's a big rabbit trail. 
Unfortunately, by the time investigators had enough evidence against Driver, he was nowhere to be found. So he must have figured out that they were on to him. It then took over two years before Driver was apprehended. That's insane. You know how hard you'd have to try to avoid surveillance cameras and stuff for two years right now? I know people oh, can yeah. do it, now, but it's, an, it's Now insane. it wouldn't be. But back then... Especially, and then, like, other countries, too. Like, the U.S. isn't the only ones where every single corner has a surveillance yeah. camera on it. Like, you can't... Yep. We we heard that in the the kidnapping case I did with Shannon. Yeah. Matthews. Matthews. Yes. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Um, That they tracked his movements, literally, mm-hmm. <laughs> from place to place to place. But back then, yeah, exactly. there wasn't such things. So it wasn't until April 2nd, 1993, that Daniel Driver would face the small Jamestown. Let me see if I can get this county name right. To Alumi, but it's spelled so different. Okay. It's spelled T U O L U M N E. But I did look up how to pronounce it, and I believe it was Tuolumne. I think you did a great job. Okay. Thank you. I was very concerned about that. So the Tuolumne County Court held a preliminary hearing for his charges. Though most of us today would consider it unthinkable, each of the boys were expected to testify in the courtroom in Holy front of Driver crap. himself, as it was the standard practice at the time. And I can absolutely validate that or confirm that because that was my case. I, at four, well, by the time court happened, four years old, I had to go and testify in a courtroom in front of the man. Yes. I don't care when in time. Who thinks that that is appropriate? Nope. It's not. It was terrifying. And the only reason I was able to do it was because, like I said, I had a very, my parents were very supportive and had already put in place things to make me feel Mm -hmm. very safe. And so, and I, and honestly, I think I was young enough. Yeah. That I didn't, like, once I, didn't have to go back to that place anymore, I already felt safer. Mm -hmm. Like, I already felt like, oh, okay, everything's going to be okay. But if I had been a little bit older, as Willie was, I don't know that I would have felt safe enough doing that. Well, and on top of that, too, like, at such a young age, you may not have realized how intense a trial is. Yeah. You just don't have context for it. Yeah. And Willie's of the age where you do. Yeah, because he's, like... Well, by this time, he's like 10. Wow. When he has to go testify. That's crazy. So Willie was chosen to testify last since his was by far the worst case. Ellie grew increasingly agitated while waiting as Willie was throwing up throughout the day and repeatedly saying he couldn't do it. And then it didn't help that the other victims' mothers would re-enter the waiting room after their child and they testified. And they often looked, like, defeated. And they would say, like, it didn't go well, it's not going well. And so they would plant seeds of doubt. Oh, and nerves, yeah. Into it. So more- Which their reaction is totally valid as well. It's just unfortunate that it affected him. Yes. So basically, it's it's building up this this idea that Daniel Driver is going to definitely going to get off the hook if Willie doesn't testify. Mm -hmm. And the other boys basically like because they were just inappropriately touched. And I don't mean just like it doesn't matter. It absolutely does. But there had been so much time in between Mm -hmm. that like things like they didn't necessarily describe things as they had in the past. And we all know how that goes. Like Mm -hmm. so. Ellie was becoming unraveled. Fair. I believe it was the mother just before, like, the last family to go in and testify before they would call Ellie and Willie that shared that their son's testimony did not go well 
And they really needed Willie to do better than her son did. That's not productive at all, my friend. So Ellie feared, like, no, he's it's going to be just like he got convicted last time. He's going to get a slap on the wrist. Mm -hmm. Nothing's going to happen. And my son is going through this for nothing to happen. Yes. Her thoughts began spiraling, and you could even say she became delusional. Okay. Whether Ellie knew her sister had brought a concealed gun in her purse or she stumbled upon it when looking for Tums is up for debate. I don't know that anybody ever really established what actually happened. I don't think it necessarily matters. No, but either way, she knew they were only moments away from calling her and Willie to the stand as the court decided to take a brief recess. She entered the courtroom with her sister, and the prosecutor asked them to take a seat while they wait. Instead, Ellie walked over and stood behind the defense attorney, who was seated next to Driver. She reached into her sister's purse, took out her sister's gun, and fired six shots to the left side of Daniel Driver's head. All but one were fatal shots. The sixth was found in the wall. Yeah. Across the room. Ellie did not try to run. She simply laid down the gun and was, of course, immediately arrested. Yeah, of course. Upon questioning her, detectives were obviously trying to determine why would you commit such an act when the man was facing justice? Like, we caught him. He's going to have a trial. Mm -hmm. I, my problem is I totally understand why she did it. Like most that's, most people did. Yeah, I, yes. it's not me saying like why would I? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I if listen, my daddy, he'd have done the same thing. I have. I, I don't want to go on a rabbit trail. Yeah, like, we don't need to. We don't need to. I I think that I would be very close mm-hmm. to doing the same thing. I just maybe would have waited to see if he got off the hook. Yeah, but she had the and opportunity. Then, yes. I mean, listen, my hands are up. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. We'll see how this goes. Yeah. Well, it gets a little more complicated, but generally speaking, there was a whole lot of people around that kind of deemed Ellie a hero. So she's in questioning. They're like, why on earth? Would you do this? Well, Ellie told them, I'm not convinced he would face justice. Yeah. He didn't really the first time. And she said, quote, you don't understand. He has raped hundreds of boys. Nobody knows if that's true. Yeah. Where'd you get that number from? Exactly. I I think that investigators did not actually believe that that was true. So it speaks to her level of like mm-hmm. paranoia and delusion. Yeah. She believed that he smugly smirked at her and Willie when he was coming into the court. Now, mind you, this isn't even like, don't think courthouse, because if you would see the building where this was, it looks like a little retail space. It yeah. was not your traditional courthouse. And so it was a very small space, you know, one little entry way in the front. That's it. So her and Willie are sitting outside because he's puking his guts out. They bring Driver in. And so he's closely walking past them to go in. And she swears that he smug he smugly smirked at her. Her sister agreed. Okay. Other people, including psychiatrists, to William, or I'm sorry, not William, Daniel Driver said that he just tends to be one of those people that smirks or smiles awkwardly when he's nervous. Okay. So there's conflicting views on that. But still, it's just, it's still evidence that she took it as that. So it, fe- it fed that state of mind of paranoia mm-hmm. is how I view it. So she claimed that she desperately didn't want to traumatize Willie any further by making him testify. 
she had asked the investigator in the waiting room if they would get into trouble should something happen to Driver. And she took the, his response of no as a green light for her to kill him. Um, so these are all like okay. the last minute little things piling up. She then tells them that there's multiple other what are actually inconsequential things or actions of the authorities, of the DA, of the judge, of everything. She starts seeing all these little signs that they're all putting in place to allow her the opportunity to kill him. Mm. Yeah, it turns into like a big conspiracy. Yeah. I mean, with enough with enough anxiety and enough trauma, I can kind of see how that would happen to somebody. Yes. It sucks. Well, there's more. Oh, no. <laughs> if you recall in the beginning, I said Ellie is generally portrayed as a loving and overprotective mom. Yeah. And as the story hit the news, it was like, oh, protective mom. Like, she's a hero. Like, yeah. that's so great. That narrative was supported by most people. But the flip side of that ended up causing some people to label her nothing but a murderer because the truth is that Ellie likely had an addiction to methamphetamine. Oh, no. Ellie, come on, man. She eventually admitted after the recorder was turned off in her interrogation that she had taken the drug the morning of the trial, but she denied taking it regularly. Okay. However, her blood tests showed levels that are typically seen in people who have taken significant doses within one to three days prior. She also admitted that if she had had the gun in her hand when Driver smirked at Willie outside the courthouse, she probably would have shot him right then. So the other signs didn't really matter. It was just the one. Like, it wouldn't have mattered if you had all these signs. Yeah, she things. was already thinking about it before. Yeah. Basically, she claimed that everything that had happened had destroyed her sense of right and wrong. Okay. From the beginning. That was her claim. I mean, you can't argue with that. Yeah. She's being honest. Yeah. Of course, she was charged with murder and the use of a firearm in the commission of the offense. Mm -hmm. She pleaded not guilty by reason of temporary insanity. Now, obviously, the facts of the case are basically undisputed. Yeah, like, there's no... There was a bunch of people around. She killed him in front of a room with a, at least a handful of people, mm -hmm. including attorneys and law enforcement. So the first question that needed answered was whether Ellie's mental health had slipped to the point of being unaware of right or wrong. The second question was, is she guilty of premeditated murder versus manslaughter? That's a good question. I can see arguments for both sides. Yes. Some important facts to consider were things that happened before and during driver's hearing. Okay. So some of which I've kind of touched on. But prior to his hearing, in the two plus years that he was a fugitive, Ellie and Willie lived in fear that he would show up to kidnap Willie or kill them all, which she had expressed to investigators the entire time. Okay. During that time, Willie had also asked questions about suicide, and shortly after, Ellie had found him with a gun, and he was about to shoot himself. Mm. So it was then that she finally put him in counseling, but she still didn't seek help for herself. Mm -hmm. Leading up to Driver's hearing, Ellie had protested the prosecutor's insistence that Willie testify at Driver's hearing. She requested it be a private videotape testimony. They denied it. So then she requested several times that it at least be closed to the public. And that was also denied. Bruh. I, I don't. There's no. I don't. My problem is I don't see a legal reason why it needs to be denied. Yeah. Like, at all. 
other than I think that just wasn't their precedent and they just viewed it as well it has to be public so that way it's fair for it him. It has to be public so that way it's fair. But to the rapist. The the re- but you could literally make it private for these children. Yeah, and it still be for the testimony of these children. And this wasn't even the trial itself. This is preliminary. So I, I don't know. even think there was a, like a jury involved yet. I think it was just the judge. So why couldn't that be private? I don't there is no reason. Well, the morning of, Willie began vomiting and did not stop the entire time while waiting to be called. She kept requesting, like, can we please? Like, clearly you see he is yeah. sick. Nope. They denied any sort of accommodation. He either testified or he didn't. It's so, it's so messed up. That's so messed up. Now, that part where I mentioned that she had you know, the conspiracy thinking had started and she asked the investigator if they would get in trouble should, quote, something happen to driver. The full question was whether the investigator or anyone in the DA's office would get in trouble should something happen to driver. Yeah. The investigator gave a negative response because he thought she was referring to the fact that Driver had been assaulted by another inmate in jail while awaiting that hearing, which... So, yeah. Not shocking. response makes sense. But does it? Because I think the fact that she asked if the DA also would get in trouble, Hmm. and him in particular, versus, like, that doesn't make sense to me. I'm not saying that her suspicions on conspiracy were correct or valid but i do kind of question that investigator like you're an investigator my dude and you didn't put two and two together at all to think like that's a weird question why would you as an investigator not she wasn't asking Mm -hmm. she wasn't asking like one of the um corrections officers she was asking a detective on the case. Hmm. And she's asking if the DA would get in trouble. Why would you guys get in trouble for him being assaulted in prison when he's out of your yeah. jurisdiction, if you will? It's weird to me that that didn't give them pause to go, why was she asking if the DA would get in, you know? Yeah. <laughs> would be responsible for him being assaulted in jail. Two... Apparently, Ellie had already caused a scene because when, oh. when he smirked at them outside of the courtroom, mm-hmm. she lunged at him. Oh, so they should have already been aware. And also, and finally, my argument is that the woman is hopped up on methamphetamine and you are a cop. Yeah, a detective, you didn't notice? an investigator, and she is getting more and more agitated and you Never noticed? <laughs> yeah, that doesn't make any sense. And you thought nothing of this? Like, I mean, I understand you're going to think she's a mom, she's nervous, but honestly, I kind of wonder if it was the typical underestimation of women. Yeah. Like, oh, she's just a hysterical woman. Or maybe they just couldn't wrap their head around a mother going that far or doing such a thing. Especially with their child right mm-hmm. there. I mean, it's kind of hard. to. It is hard to imagine. I think my opinion is just like that they never had any reason to think it would be that weird. Now, are you trained to catch those things? Yes. Especially the fact that she was hopped up on meth. But- yeah. And if, it, if she had just been asking, like, if it had just been, you know, a staff of the court or something, I would have a totally different opinion. But in the court documents, it specifically says that she asked one of the investigators. Yeah, that is strange to me. So that's what gives me pause and go, what? Wait, what? I don't know. I I just feel like... I get behind. I'm with you. Yeah. In any case, there they were trying to determine Ellie's mental state the day of the shooting. 
So as we discussed on your last case, mm-hmm. on the shabizness. business. It was a trial split into two phases. Mm-hmm. The guilty phase, the sanity phase. I'm going to kind of go backwards, though, because of the way their court document was laid out. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to kind of go backwards. So on the sanity phase... Uh, Three defense experts testified that Ellie was legally insane at the time of the shooting. Two of them diagnosed her with PTSD, citing it was caused by her own rape as a child and young woman. And they specifically use that language, which leads me to believe that it was somebody that it was repetitive and over a period of years. But they believe that Willie's experience like triggered her Mm -hmm. and and heightened her symptoms of PTSD. I can get behind that. I understand. I understand what they're saying. And I understand that even she said that it adjusts like the whole situation had, you know, Mm -hmm. affected her ability to tell right from wrong. Yes. They believed that the stress of that day caused her to misperceive reality, leading her to believe the authorities actually facilitated the act and like made it possible or gave her the opportunity. Free my girl. She ain't do nothing. (laughs) One of the experts concluded that she suffered a brief reactive psychosis that caused her to be temporarily delusional. All three of them agreed that due to these reasons, along with other mental health diagnoses, she was unable to distinguish, quote, the generally accepted moral standard of right and wrong. Yeah. Okay. Two of them did not believe Ellie's drug use was specifically relevant to her state of mind at the time, whereas the third believed that she was suffering from substance abuse, is how they phrased it, and that it did have an effect on her. Okay. Now, Ellie had admitted to one or more of these experts that her methamphetamine use actually began in the fall of 1992, you know, within like six months or so before this happened and she said that she had taken it both the night before the hearing and the morning of it okay but that wasn't really what the her talks report said right it said like yeah at that point when she was questioned by police she denied having a substance abuse issue of it she just said well that morning i took it okay i'm sorry and The blood test showed that she had, like, a rather significant amount, but it couldn't prove. It just said a significant amount within one to three days prior of the test. So what does that mean? Like, basically, it alluded to there was more in her system than she kind of led them to believe is all. Uh, She also had told at least one of the experts that she believed the drug gave her a false sense of reality causing her to do things she normally would never do. Well, and in business, she did meth, and she said it made her paranoid. Yes. Which I think paranoia is a typical Mm -hmm. side effect, if you will. I've never done meth myself. No, you know, I'm not (laughs) familiar, but... um... I mean, and honestly, that has a lot to do with my lack of drug use in my life is that I already tend to be a down and slightly paranoid person. Well, listen, we didn't even know all the names that she used for meth in the last episode. Oh, yeah. Well, Ellie calls it crank. Yeah, I I heard crank before. Yeah, she calls it crank. That was pretty common. She wasn't down with smoking the bitch. (laughs) Yeah, I think that was like a time period thing because then it was called crank and apparently in 2022, it's called the bitch. So, (laughs) and ice. (laughs) Well, you know. Show business is so show much business. cooler than Ellie. Yeah, we were out there smoking the bitch. What's that? <laughs> what is it? What does that mean? Ice. Oh, I can't get over it. Okay. So one of the experts testified that they believed the reason she felt she had to kill Driver was that she feared she would go that he would go free. And she worried about Willie having to live in constant fear that Driver would come back and hurt him again. Yeah. It's all making... The math is mathing to me. I don't... Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. Ellie also clearly felt guilty for not protecting Willie from his abuse and rape happening in the first place. 
So they said she took kind of an overbearing sense of responsibility to stop it from happening again. But poor Ellie, like, you, it's so hard because she sent him to some place that she thought was safe. Like, yes. And that sucks because obviously she's going to blame herself and she shouldn't because you're not the one who did it. Like, yeah. that's, and I always, I, it's so hard because I can understand why you would feel that way. But I can guarantee, especially as a survivor of abuse myself, I would absolutely feel that way. If something had, if I, especially if mm-hmm. I chose to send my kids someplace, you know, I would, I absolutely could relate to that. Mm-hmm. I would feel terrible. Like I didn't do my job. Yeah. But it's not, it's not, it's not their fault. It's not her fault. Wouldn't be your no, fault. Not at all. It's just hard. I just want to give her a big hug. Well, you can't. I'm Damn sorry. It. <laughs> Damn it. We'll we'll find out. Not for the reason you probably think, but well, I mean, yeah. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> um, so the prosecution had four experts testify. So there's a lot of experts. Yeah, that's a lot. Here. And it's expensive. They're expensive. Um, they of course said no. She was legally sane. They did agree that she suffered from PTSD and substance abuse, but they believed that she still retained the capacity to recognize right from wrong. I disagree. Her paranoia was bad. Like, I don't. It was bad. And I and to me, and here's what's getting me. The logic behind her paranoia kind of makes sense. Like, if I was a paranoid person and I saw I get it. Yeah. Like, I'm with you, girl. The thing that I question is that in the court documents, like I said, the defense experts mention, oh, and with her other mental health diagnoses, mm-hmm. they don't say what it is. So what is it? So what it goes are we back to that here? question of, like, she business, like, she had a mental health diagnosis, plus she's doing methamphetamines, plus she did something else. Like... When you put all that in together, yeah. and I know that that happens a lot in cases where people like commit acts on drugs, they often, I mean, oftentimes people who become addicts often suffer from some sort of mental mm-hmm. health disorder. That's kind of why they're addicts. But it's still like, it, I don't know, but it's still difference- an explanation for w- the combination yeah. of those things is going to be terrible enough to make people the difference for me though is that she like she was so far into her delirium that she did not think about it being right or wrong she just thought that's what was happening yeah versus back in she business i know we're referencing that a lot but the two cases are really similar yes in a a couple different ways and so she, she said she thought about whether or not it was right or wrong and she did it anyway she cleaned up after herself. She was like, I know I shouldn't have done it, but I did it anyway. Yeah. Ellie did it. She thought it was right. Yes. Yeah. She was 100% convinced that he was going to mm-hmm. get let go, that this was the right thing to do. This was the only way to keep her son safe. And is that not the and definition? And to keep other boys safe. Exactly. And that, you know, paranoia of like, not paranoia, but delusion that there is no other option. Is yeah. that not in the definition of like you don't know right or wrong or the de- you know the difference? Yeah, because clearly this is wrong. You don't kill people. Yeah, not in a courtroom. Like you shouldn't kill them ever. But you don't just walk up to somebody in a courtroom and shoot them in the head. Yeah, but in her head that was right. And honestly, long after, when she's interviewed years mm-hmm. later. You can tell she struggled with answering the question, do you regret doing this? Mm-hmm. She couldn't give a solid yes or no. I don't want to quote because I, I didn't write it down and mm-hmm. I don't remember exactly, but it was in an Oprah interview. And she clearly was still of that mindset of like, she believed yeah. that that was the only way to protect her son and other kids. The only reason she regretted it was that it took it or her away from her kids. Yeah. But other than that, she wholeheartedly yeah. believed that. One of the prosecution's experts testified that while the combination of Ellie's 
ADHD. So there's one more diagnosis. Okay. And amphetamine intoxication. ADHD could and the meth could lead to some impulse control issues. Ding, ding, ding. That's exactly what I was just about to say. <laughs> I'm so smart. Um, he said may have increased her impulsivity, but it did not diminish her capacity to act rationally. I don't think it had anything to do with the meth, though. Like, I think her, her diminished capacity had everything to do with her trauma. Yes, I agree. I and, think it had yeah. at least a lot more to do with her trauma. than. And, you know, maybe the experts were got hung up on the meth. But I don't think that that has anything to do with it personally. I didn't really think that the meth had much to do with show business either. Yeah, I agree. A court appointed, so this makes another mm-hmm. expert, a court appointed psychiatrist, then testified that it was a difficult case and that they struggled to reach their opinion, but ultimately decided that Ellie was legally sane. After deliberating for a week, the jury found her sane. Boo, tomato, tomato, tomato. <laughs> I disagree, but I feel like I can see how a jury who's sitting in a courtroom, similar to how the other jury was, yeah. like, could be influenced by their surroundings a little bit, if that makes sense. Well, yeah. Ellie was nothing like shabizness, but... No, but I mean, like, they're sitting in a courtroom... Similar to how the jury was sitting in a courtroom listening to Driver's case, and they're staring at this woman who is, you know. Yeah. That's hard. So the guilty fa- the guilt phase of the trial pretty much included what I already discussed. Like, it's pretty cut and dry. Like, obviously, yeah. she's guilty of killing him. But was she guilty of premeditated murder? Or not. Well, luckily, the jury found her guilty of the lesser included offense of voluntary manslaughter, as well as the firearms charge. With the case as extraordinary as this one, though, you know it's not over. Nope. Like I said, there was a ton of media coverage. She was deemed a hero by a lot of people. She was deemed the devil by some people. I gonna look at her and say she's the devil i won't say they didn't those aren't their words but they definitely were like no she shot a man you know what about that daniel driver's mother she lost a son well your son was a pedophile (laughs) so the thing is is that ellie actually motioned the trial court for a new trial on grounds of juror misconduct oh that's interesting what does she allege happened It turned out that one of the jurors had been talking to multiple other jurors about Ellie's life outside of the context of the charges. Interesting. Multiple jurors testified that this one juror, we will call her Miss Catherine. Oh, Miss Catherine. Had openly made comments about knowing what kind of woman and mother Ellie was. Miss Catherine made her own allegations that Ellie was a drug addict, was friends with drug dealers, and even claimed that she did the exact opposite of what the testimony in court suggested when it came to allowing others to babysit her kids. So she just lets randos babysit her kids? According to Miss Catherine, she had heard from a former babysitter of Ellie's that Ellie would take off and leave her kids for days at a time. When other jurors would shut down the talk because they were only supposed to deliberate over things presented in the courtroom. Yeah. Miss Catherine would mutter stuff under her breath, then say things like, if you only knew what I know, every time she was debating with another juror who disagreed with her. Uh, Okay. I I think that that is juror misconduct. Mm Mm-hmm. The court heard the testimonies of multiple jurors, including Miss Catherine herself, who admitted she didn't know Ellie personally, but that there was a woman at a bar she went to that very loudly expressed these opinions and issues when seeing a news commercial mention the trial. Catherine claimed that it didn't occur to her to leave the bar and that she thought the woman was drunk, so she didn't take it seriously. But you're... But you're on, 
Exactly. You're, you're involved in the trial. <laughs> like you can't. That's literally, the, they give you these things. They're called jury instructions. Mm-hmm. And they, they read them to you. And they're very specific. And not only that, but if you didn't take it seriously, why would you show up to court again and start talking, talking about, about it, it as if it's serious? Yeah. So even though Catherine never reported the incident to the court during the trial, and multiple other jurors testified that she clearly said things indicating she did take the rumor seriously, including, quote, that bitch got what she deserved. <gasps> After the verdict was given, the trial court denied Ellie's petition for a new trial, noting that Miss Catherine used coarse language throughout deliberations, so calling Ellie a bitch doesn't prove prejudgment or bias against her. It's not the word bitch that makes it bad. It's the other stuff surrounding what she's saying. Mm -hmm. It's her action, not her language. Well, Ellie appealed that denial, and then the appellate court granted a review, but affirmed the trial court's decision. Boo. Tomato, tomato, tomato. So in August of 1997... Her next appeal Mm -hmm. came through, and the California Supreme Court granted a review and thankfully had the sense to call misconduct for what it was. Yeah, thank you. So I will put it as simply as possible. They basically said that Miss Catherine, one, committed misconduct by not leaving the bar, Mm -hmm. two, by not informing the court of what happened, and three, by talking about it with other jurors. Mm -hmm. It's really quite simple. (laughs) Yeah, it's really not that hard. (laughs) The only stipulation to the Supreme Court overturning the lower court's decisions was that it only applied to the sanity phase of the trial. So I kind of gave my information backwards, but as you had said in Shabiznis, they kind of do the guilt verdict the guilt phase first and then they talk about and then the sanity phase is after yeah so apparently that happened that incident in the bar happened after the guilt phase before the sanity phase okay before or during the sanity phase the supreme court reversed the appellate court's affirmation and remanded that court with directions to remand the matter to the trial court for a new trial on the issue of Ellie's insanity. Okay. Ultimately, though, Ellie's sentence was released when she struck a deal to plead guilty to the manslaughter charge after serving just shy of four years. Okay. Which you may be questioning, well, if all they had to do was the new trial for her sanity, then, like, why would they offer her a deal? Well, because Ellie had been diagnosed with a serious form of breast cancer while awaiting her initial trial, and her prognosis was an estimate of only five years to live. Oh, that's so sad. So she had served almost four years. They basically said, this woman's... She's dying. She's going to die very soon. Like, just let her... She served some time. She's Which, not a danger to society. Exactly. Because and, it was a one-time incident. And yes. it's it wasn't planned. It wasn't premeditated. I get it. Like Yes. And th- I think that was compassionate of them. Yes. Fortunately, she made it longer than the five years. Yay! Unfortunately, oh. Ellie's substance abuse issues didn't end there. Oh, no. I was worried that was going to happen. In 2002, she pleaded guilty to drug charges and was sentenced to six years. That's the year I was born. She was released in 2006 after another four years served. Um, And then she actually didn't pass away until December of 2008 at just 56 years old. Of breast cancer? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. That's really young. That sucks. So, even though much of the world hailed her as a hero, according to Ellie's kids, having their family torn apart after her arrest was by far worse 
oh yeah than the trauma that daniel driver caused oh yeah i would never say that she's a hero what i will say is that i understand how she got there and that yes. i i personally think that she was insane yeah like ngi in the moment yes i agree with that because i can understand as a as a mom and as a survivor myself i would definitely feel compelled to kill the person yeah and if you had any other outside influence at all right but i think that would be the one thing that would stop me is that killing this person is going to take me away from my children yeah and especially the fact that she was essentially a single mom because mm-hmm. bill had i think they might have still been married legally but he was in africa yeah my man's was digging he he's chasing gold like and unfortunately, he never came back after his case. Like, he didn't, he, he might have come back. I, I have no idea what his story oh, is, but maybe he, he did not, co- like, I half expected, well, at least maybe their dad came back and then he would no, but no. live with them. No. Maybe he married an elephant. They got split up. What? <laughs> maybe he married an elephant. The kids got split up? Yes. Bummer. Willie went to live with an aunt while Rebecca went to live with their grandparents. They're already being destroyed. Why? Yes, exactly. So how old was her? Wait, how old was Rebecca? Rebecca was, I believe, just like three years younger than Willie. So So when everything happened, Willie was six. But the trial and all of this happened. So the trial, she she would have been like seven. I was just trying to understand why they would have separated them and maybe like if it was grandparents and they ha- she was really young. I think that it was just a matter because I know the aunt had her own kids and stuff. Mm-hmm. But Willie still had a lot of, I think, behavioral issues. I see. And so I think it may have been one of those things where the aunt was like, well, can't be around my kids. You well, no, Willie went to live with her. I'm sorry. I, I think happens. he was very close with the aunt. And I also think that it may have been one of those things where they're like, you know, the grandparents won't be able to handle all this behavior stuff. Oh, I see. But they can handle Rebecca because she's easy. Like, she's she doesn't. Like, this is traumatizing for her, but, like, she's mm-hmm. not having behavioral issues. Well, and separating on one hand may have done them some good. It just, it depends. It can go either way. Yeah. Well, it definitely affected them both. Oh, absolutely. Because they did that Oprah interview as well. Oh. And they talked about, like, this was the most traumatic thing. Like, yes, that was traumatic for Willie, but this by far traumatized us way more. Oh, absolutely. Um, Rebecca fared well growing up with her grandparents, and she did relatively well in life. No troubles. Didn't become a drug addict. I don't know what she does exactly. Yeah. Not um, Frank. Willie did not. Oh, no. Willie got himself into quite a bit of trouble with the law, even as a juvenile. Those youths. The youths. The youths. His anger very much got the best of him when he was just 23 years old. Willie was living on the family property... Basically, they had a piece of land, and they had, I think, several trailers or mobile homes on mm-hmm. it. And so at some point, I don't know if the aunt, I think the aunt might have lived in one. And so Willie still got to, like, stay in the general property. But then I think as an adult, young adult, he had moved back to possibly where Ellie had lived, you know, yeah. the trailer or whatever that they had lived in when, when he was young. And then the family had hired this man, um, David Davis, to live on the property as well as be essentially a caretaker or, you know, keep Mm -hmm. up with the property. Well, Willie and Dave Davis had a bit of a falling out or dispute. David Davis had called the police alleging that Willie had stolen some of his tools and When the officers arrived, three officers to be exact, Willie punched David right in front of them. (laughs) Oh. So they arrested him. He pleaded guilty to misdemeanor battery, served about a month of a 60-day sentence. All is well, right? 
Mm, no. Less than an hour after being released, on good behavior, mind you, Willie returned to the property and assaulted David again. This time, stomping on his head <gasps> when David was down. Oh, my god! David was actually disabled. Oh. So he couldn't, I guess he, like, tried to run, and he tripped and fell, like, and then he couldn't get himself back up fast enough. And he really couldn't defend himself because of his disability. Oh, Lord. This was this just took a really bad turn. Yeah. I mean, ugh. So David never um never regained consciousness. No, stop it. You're kidding. And he died the next day. <gasps> Alicia! <laughs> I didn't do it. I know, but you're telling me about it. <laughs> uh... Willie initially tried to run, but was eventually arrested and was convicted of first-degree murder in 2005 and handed a sentence of 25 years to life. Yeah, he deserves that. So, in case you haven't kept track of those dates, that meant that the only time that Ellie and Willie were together after she shot Driver was for the short period of time that they actually allowed her to be out on bail. Before she got arrested bef- again. Before she, her trial. hmm And then for a brief time between her release in 1997 until she was arrested again on the drug charges in 2002. By the time Ellie was released in 2006, Willie was already in prison for murder. And then when her health got worse and they knew she didn't have long, Willie tried to request a temporary leave Mm -hmm. to see her and or attend her funeral, which was denied. They would only allow him to talk to her on the phone. That's rude. So the Nestler family's story. Well, that's such a bummer. I'm sorry. But unfortunately, unfortunately, this happens a lot with true yeah. crime like it's not it doesn't the person doesn't go to jail and then it's happily ever after most of the time yeah like there's so much trauma that comes from this stuff and it's just it's terrible and i'm sorry i know i'm always the bummer that's why i always like look up the information <laughs> because i want to know for myself and then i think well maybe i shouldn't put it in and then i think yeah but there's probably people out there like me that want to know yeah. but then it's such a bummer to it's end such on such a bummer but Rebecca's doing well, I yeah, guess. Yeah, Rebecca's doing great. She survived, and she's doing well. And actually, in 2010, I want to say, she did a follow-up interview with Oprah and a correspondent, and they actually went to the prison so she could see Willie. So that's such I a guess bummer. that's okay. And hopefully, if Willie gets his anger under control... Uh, he well. can get maybe he'll get out after but no i mean he he killed somebody yeah like that's well yeah and it was that was a silly thing and yeah, i that was like dumb. that was you're gonna kill a man because he accused you of stealing his tools like this is stupid yeah at least i could understand how ellie got there it's just so hard this is such a messy case on so many levels Tis. But you did a good job covering it. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Well, thanks for sticking in there. If you made it this far, go leave a the little courthouse building emoji under yeah. our post for the episode. And um we'll get a Sunday shout out. Yeah, on. Sunday shout outs. I don't even know. This was such a this is a, this was a case. It was a case. I'm sorry. I'm so good at picking the sad ones. It's okay. I picked a I particularly gruesome one last week. So. I don't do it intentionally. I, I just must I be. I wonder like, what that says about you. I know. <laughs> I often wonder that myself. I, I, every time. Every time I'm like, this one seems interesting. And then I dive into it. And I'm like, this is horribly sad. What does that say about but me? But what's crazy is I don't find the case. Like, I don't find cases like that. You are just gravitated <laughs> to them. Know. What is wrong with me? I don't know. Shit business. Shit business. <laughs> All right. <laughs> On that note, thanks. Bye. For, thanks for listening. Thanks for Bye.
Thanks for listening, guys. Find us on Instagram and TikTok at Burden of Proof Pod and email us at burdenofproofpod at gmail.com.